This is Thames Television, operating on the London area transmitters of the Independent Broadcasting Authority. yourself, perhaps you've seen someone else riding. Have you noticed that the rider sits on a special seat? It's called a saddle. Saddles are made of leather. Leather comes from the skins of animals. The skins are treated so that they can be used to make all kinds of things. It's very important to choose the right leather for the job. We're going to see a saddle being made. 
This man is cutting some of the pieces of the saddle from a thick hide of leather. He has a pattern for each part of the saddle. He uses a sharp knife to cut round the patterns. This is what the frame of a saddle looks like before it's covered with leather. First, the saddle maker uses a piece of soft leather to cover the frame. He stretches the leather tightly over the frame. The saddle maker draws round the pieces he fits over the soft leather. Then he separates them again. The marks he has made help to guide the person who stitches the pieces together. The thread used for stitching is very strong. When the pieces have been stitched together, the saddle maker stretches them once more over the frame. Then he nails them firmly in place. This is the inside of the saddle. The saddle frame slots into it. It's padded so it'll rest comfortably on the horse's back. All the stitching on a saddle is done by hand. A pointed tool is used to make a hole in the leather. It makes it easier for the needle and thread to go through the leather. On each side of the saddle, the saddle maker fits a flap. The flaps cover the straps which will hold the saddle on the horse's back. There are only a few more straps to fit before the saddle will be ready for use. Like this one. something else made of leather. This is a drawing of a girl's shoe. Each shoe is made up of several pieces. The designer cuts a pattern for each piece. Then a metal copy of each pattern is made. This man is a cutter. He checks the skin to see it's not torn or scratched. He uses the metal shapes to cut the pieces for the shoe out of the leather. The pieces have to be stitched together on a sewing machine. make the top part of the shoe, the upper. These are going to be lace-up shoes, so they have eyelets in them. Listen to the machine pressing in the eyelets.
This machine shapes the heels and pairs up the shoes. One for the right foot and one for the left. Look how the soft leather stretches. Before the toes are shaped, the leather is steamed. Let's watch a shoe with a buckle being shaped. Now our lace-up shoes are ready to go into the machine. The uppers are being stretched over a model of a foot. machine nails the leather uppers to the inner sole of the shoe. The soles are put into a kind of oven to heat the glue on them. Then they are fitted exactly onto the upper part of the shoe. This machine presses the two parts together so that they stick firmly. Now for the heel. This machine nails on the heel from the inside of the shoe. Every shoe has a lining stuck inside it. It makes the shoes smooth and comfortable to wear. Lastly, the laces are threaded through the eyelets and fastened. fastening shoelaces. Now the shoes are ready to be sold in the shops. Okay then, lovely, just stand up again. Just have another look at you. Yes, that just gives her a little bit extra width across the toes. Is the bones are okay? Plenty of growth room in there. We always allow for growth room. Okay, lovely, just have another little walk for me. A little bit wobbly. Do you think you'll get used to those heels? Yes. A little bit higher, aren't you, than your other ones? Yes. Okay then. We feel nice and comfortable? Yes. Yeah. Jolly good.
the world's most important metals, aluminium. Our story starts here in the Republic of Ireland. Bauxite, impure aluminium oxide, arrives at Ochinish on the Shannon estuary. The ore may have come from many different parts of the world. This came from northwest Africa. There are also major reserves in Jamaica, Central America, Australia. It's stored in these giant buildings ready for the purification process. The roof's a lightweight structure. Its slope exactly parallels the slope angle of the great mountain of bauxite inside. To purify the bauxite, it's first treated with hot sodium hydroxide solution in these giant pressure vessels. Let's look at what happens on the laboratory scale. In the beaker, we put some bauxite, impure aluminium oxide, and we heat it up with sodium hydroxide solution, a strong alkali. Now, aluminium oxide is amphoteric. It acts both as an acid and as a base, so it dissolves in the alkali to form a salt, sodium aluminate, but the impurities are not affected. Filter, and the sodium aluminate solution passes through the filter paper, leaving the impurities behind. If we now acidify the filtrate, it is precipitated. This pure white aluminium hydroxide can be filtered off and heated to produce pure alumina, aluminium oxide. In the plant at Hochinish, the aluminium hydroxide is precipitated in a different way, in these huge tanks, but the principle is the same. The aluminium hydroxide is heated to produce pure alumina, and this is carried out to waiting ships. Now, in the lab, the impurities from the bauxite were left on the filter paper, mainly iron-3 oxide. Industrially, vast tonnages of this red mud are produced, and at Orkinish, this is spread in huge lagoons over a layer of tough plastic sheeting so that the environment around is not polluted in any way. In fact, there's a nature reserve right next to the lagoons where many water birds breed. Leaving the red mud behind, let's follow one load of the purified alumina to Hollyhead on the Isle of Anglesey in North Wales to see how metallic aluminium is produced from it. The fine white powder is removed through powerful vacuum pipes. 200,000 tonnes of alumina a year arrive here, some from Ireland, some from other sources. It's carried by tunnel to the Anglesey aluminium smelting plant. How can we produce aluminium from this oxide? The important thing to understand is that aluminium is a very reactive element. You can see this if you take fine aluminium powder and sprinkle it into a Bunsen burner flame. It burns very fiercely to give the oxide. Bigger pieces of aluminium don't burn, which is why we can use, for example, saucepans made of the metal. The point is that the metal carries a hard, thin coating of its oxide, which stops it burning. If this coating is removed, then you can watch the aluminium spontaneously changing into the oxide as it reacts with oxygen in the air. Metals which aren't very reactive are fairly easy to produce from their oxides. For example, you only have to heat up mercury-2 oxide for it to split up into mercury and oxygen.
you can see metallic mercury condensing on the side of the test tube. Mercury 2 oxide decomposes on heating to give metallic mercury and oxygen because mercury is not a very reactive metal. Copper is slightly more reactive. If we heat copper to oxide, it does not decompose, at least not using normal laboratory methods. We'll flush out the air with nitrogen. Perhaps you'll see why in a moment. We'll now pass hydrogen over the heated copper oxide. Watch what happens. Very soon we can see metallic copper being produced. There it is, in the middle of the boat. Hydrogen is more reactive than copper and reduces the copper to oxide, taking the oxygen away to form water and leaving the less reactive copper. Now, if we try this with aluminium oxide, nothing happens at least not under these laboratory conditions. Because aluminium is very reactive, it hangs on to the oxygen and no metal is produced. The aluminium oxide, alumina, is completely unchanged. So how can we get aluminium from its oxide? The answer is by using electricity, by electrolysis. This is an electrolytic cell for producing aluminium. Let's look at how it works. This is the end view. There's a steel shell lined with carbon blocks. Blocks of pure carbon mounted on metal rods dip down into it and it's filled with cryolite, another aluminium compound in which the alumina is dissolved at 970 degrees C. The cell and lining blocks are made the cathode, negative, the carbon blocks, the positive anodes. At the anodes, oxide ions give up electrons and become oxygen gas. At the cathode, positive aluminium ions pick up electrons and are reduced to aluminium metal. So molten aluminium collects at the bottom of the cell, and when enough has accumulated, it can be run off. The process is a continuous one, and the cell is never allowed to cool down. Here are the massive electrical connections to the cathode and to the anodes. There are 18 anodes to each cell. The whole plant at Anglesey Aluminium uses enormous amounts of electricity, a current of 145,000 amps with a voltage drop of about 4 volts across each cell. There are 308 cells, each producing aluminium, in four enormous rooms, consuming 200 megawatts of power. This is just part of one of them. As the dissolved alumina is separated into aluminium and oxygen by the electrolysis, fresh alumina has to be added. Hoppers on top of each cell are filled from this giant overhead conveyor. Each cell is controlled automatically. The crust which forms on top of the electrolyte has to be broken before shots of fresh alumina are dropped in from the hopper at the top. Under the top layer, the electrolyte activity takes place. The molten electrolyte bubbles. Carbon gradually burns away in the oxygen liberated at the anodes, forming carbon dioxide. So each anode has to be replaced about every three weeks. Here are the remains of two burned up anodes being removed from a cell. What's left of the anodes is broken off to be used again in making new ones.
To make new anodes, pure carbon from petroleum refining is mixed with pitch and the remains of old anodes and compressed into blocks. Each block is carefully checked for size. Here are some anode blocks waiting for the next stage. A lot of the space occupied by the Anglesey aluminium plant is taken up by anode production. 300 pairs of anodes are changed every day. They're baked for 18 days in great underground furnaces. Then they're almost ready for use in the cells. But first, they're sprayed with aluminium. What do you think this might be for? Here are new anodes, awaiting their turns to be taken to the cell rooms. They're fitting one into a cell. First, the crust has to be broken. Down it goes into the hot electrolyte. Here are the roofs of the four long cell rooms. It's important not to allow any harmful fumes out into the atmosphere, and all the gases and vapors produced by the cells and during the baking of the anodes are carefully filtered and purified before they enter the high stack which releases them into the atmosphere. Approximately one tonne of aluminium is produced in each cell per day. This is drawn off by a vacuum tube into a crucible. This holds about five tonnes of liquid aluminium at over 900 degrees C. It's poured into holding furnaces where it's kept molten. Other elements can be added to produce aluminium alloys for various uses, such as iron, silicon, manganese, magnesium. The liquid is stirred using a special stirring block suspended from a crane. If you watch carefully, you can see where some of the aluminium burns. The slag floating on top consists mainly of aluminium oxide and aluminium nitride, and it's scraped off. This is one of the gas jets keeping the metal hot. The molten alloy is poured into moulds to produce what are called sows. The melting point is about 630 degrees C, and it quickly solidifies. Each sow weighs 500 kilos, half a metric ton. Smaller pigs are also produced, each weighing 50 kilos. Sows and pigs are sold to customers who remelt them to make whatever articles they want to produce and by a process called continuous casting, these are produced. This is a rolling ingot, weighing 10 metric tons. Many articles can be fabricated from it. The aluminium in its various forms is stored until lorries take it to customers throughout the country. This smelting plant produces 100,000 metric tons of aluminium every year.
Aluminium has very many uses. It can be used in buildings, aluminium handrails, aluminium door frames, aluminium window frames. Aluminium alloys are used in the aircraft industry. Something very different, cooking foil. And aluminium is a very good electrical conductor and its density is low, so it's used, for example, in electricity cables. Here's a very different use of the metal. This is aluminium powder. This is iron three oxide. Neither of them is magnetic. If we mix aluminium powder and iron three oxide and ignite it with a fuse made of magnesium ribbon, taking the necessary precautions, watch. Generating a lot of heat. Pull it down. A lump of metallic iron has been produced. See how it's attracted by the magnet? Aluminium is more reactive than iron and takes away the oxygen, forming aluminium oxide and metallic iron. This would be far too expensive a way of producing iron, but it can be used when intense heat is needed to weld metals together. Steel railway track is the best example. The mixture is called thermit. When it's ignited, the aluminium reduces the iron oxide, takes away its oxygen, and great heat is produced, this time on a bigger scale than we used in the laboratory. Pull the plug out and hot iron falls onto the gap in the rails. The rails have been welded together. This isn't the most important use of aluminium, but it reminds us what a very reactive metal it is. That's why it must be won from its ores using electrical energy as you've seen in this film at Anglesey Aluminium.
fo fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. <laughs> Hello. I expect you've all heard that before. It's what every self-respecting giant says when he suspects there's an intruder in this castle. Like Jack, who climbed the magic beanstalk to see what he could find. It's a very old story, and it's been told in very many different ways. Today, we have an animated film version using cut-out silhouettes. You'll see what I mean. This... Of course... Once upon a time, grown-ups too used to tell and listen to tales such as Jack and the Beanstalk. They loved to hear them over and over again. But such tales often gave them a lot to think about as well. You may like to go on thinking about the story too, but for the moment, to end with and by way of contrast, here's a really modern animated film. It uses the most up-to-date of techniques, it's very cleverly drawn, and it's fun too. It's called Butterfly Ball. Goodbye.
During this film, you'll need to take down readings from the screen. We're going to determine the carbon and hydrogen content of an unknown organic compound which also contains nitrogen. The unknown solid will be placed inside a platinum boat in the silica combustion tube. It will be heated in a stream of oxygen from this cylinder. But first, we must make sure that the oxygen is completely pure. We pass it into the furnace, where a catalyst in this tube gets rid of any impurities which would affect our results. From here, the oxygen passes out again to this side of the apparatus, where there's a further purification train and a valve and flow meter to get the flow of oxygen just right. The unknown sample in the boat will be heated in this tube so that its vapour, mixed with pure oxygen, passes into the furnace. A sequence of baffles makes sure that we get a good mixing and that the unknown substance is completely oxidised inside the furnace. The gases emerging from the furnace pass over a strip of silver gauze which will remove any halogens which might be present as silver halides. Then the gases reach an absorption train. The first absorption tube will absorb water vapour formed from the hydrogen in our sample. It's packed with granules of magnesium perchlorate. The remaining gases pass into the central tube which contains a catalyst to remove any oxides of nitrogen formed in the combustion furnaces. The black substance is manganese 4 oxide. Finally, the gases pass into the third and last absorption tube which contains a substance to absorb the carbon dioxide formed from the carbon in the unknown. Brown granules of soda asbestos. Any residual gases pass out here into the atmosphere. Now, let's close up the apparatus and actually carry out a combustion from which we can calculate the percentage weight of carbon and hydrogen in the unknown substance. You must get ready to take down some readings. Before combustion, we must first of all weigh the water absorption tube. Write down the weight to five places of decimals. 12.85392 grams. 12. 0.85392 grams. That was the weight of the water absorption tube. Now we must find the initial weight of the carbon dioxide absorption tube. Write down initial weight of carbon dioxide absorption tube. Here it is to five places, 13.09651 grams. 13.09651 grams. Put it down. We attach the tubes to the outlet from the furnace and open the taps. Pure dry oxygen is already passing through the furnaces at a slow rate. Now we must weigh an empty platinum boat. We're going to put our sample in this. Write down this weight for the empty boat. Nought point four one seven two one grams. All our weights, by the way, will be to five decimal places. Now we put in some of our unknown substance, a white solid. We're going to find out how much carbon and how much hydrogen this contains. Get ready to write down the weight of the platinum boat plus the sample. Here it is. Nought 
8.42973 grams. Write it down, check it for yourself. So there's our weighed sample in its platinum boat. We now transfer it to the combustion apparatus. Using a glass rod, we push it carefully inside the silica tube. And replace the bung. Now we adjust the oxygen flow to get it just right. And we adjust the electrical heaters on the furnaces and wait for them to come up to temperature. Now we can start to heat the sample. This particular substance soon starts to sublime. Watch. There's the white sublimate just appearing above the boat. We're driving the sample mixed with oxygen towards the furnace. The glass wool plug regulates the flow of gas so that there are no sudden surges. The boat's now empty. Soon we shall have driven all the sample into the furnace. The sample vapour will oxidise completely inside the furnace. Water vapour and carbon dioxide emerge from the other side to be absorbed in the weighed tubes. After about 10 minutes, the combustion has been completed and we can now re-weigh the tubes. Write down the new weight of the water absorption tube. Here it is. That will give you the weight of water formed. Now we must weigh the carbon dioxide absorption tube. Write this down, 13 point something grams. Write it down to the five decimal places. We must now find out the percentage of nitrogen in our unknown solid. To do this, we use a small aluminium cup, which has first to be weighed empty. Put this down, weight of aluminium cup empty. We fill it with some more of our sample. And now write this down, the weight of the cup plus the sample. We now transfer the sample to a glass flask. Cup and sample go into the flask. We add red phosphorus and some hydroiodic acid. The idea this time is to reduce the unknown substance and convert all its nitrogen into the amino form so that later it can be estimated as ammonia. We put the flask and its contents into an electrical heater and heat it gently for about half an hour. The aluminium of the little cup reacts with the acid and this may also reduce our sample organic compound. Vapours are led off by suction from the top of the digesting unit.
After half an hour, and when the flask has cooled, we now add concentrated sulfuric acid. We turn the heating up and start to drive off the iodine that's produced. After a short while, there's no colour of iodine left in the flask. This is a special catalyst to make sure that all the nitrogen will be converted to ammonium sulphate. We place some in the reaction flask. Now we heat the mixture for another half an hour. Then the flask's removed and the liquid transferred to a steam distillation apparatus. Altogether, we rinse the flask out four times with distilled water. Now we add some sodium hydroxide solution, which will liberate ammonia. And from a pipette, sodium sulphide solution to make sure that any ammonia complexes with the catalyst are decomposed. And there's the mixture, ready for steam distillation. When we pass steam through it, ammonia will be driven off, and this will pass out down the condenser and dissolve in boric acid in a conical flask at the bottom here. The water boiler has been switched on, and there's a good head of steam. Now we can pass steam into our mixture. Ammonia is being driven off, containing all the nitrogen that was in our original sample of the unknown solid. And it's being absorbed here in the boric acid. When no more ammonia comes over, we dismantle the apparatus and titrate this liquid against standard acid to find out the weight of ammonia present. Here's the titration setup. The experiment booklet gives you the strength of the acid in the microburette. Now for the titration. If we stop stirring for a moment, you can see the local color change around the jet of the microburette. Start it up again. And here's the end point. Write it down. 2.35 cc or 2.36 cc of acid. Estimate it for yourself and write it down. Now, from the notes in the experiment booklet, and using your own readings from the combustion, and from the nitrogen estimation, you can work out the empirical formula of the unknown solid.
Just in time for the coronation. Aye, that's what your mother thinks. <laughs> so you'll be able to come to a party on coronation day, will you? It'll be a bit of a squash, what with our Trisha flying in and all. Trisha's going. They'll all be there. It'll be a grand reunion. Oh, marvellous. Hey, that explains why Mum's finally getting rid of the piano. Hey, To make room for the television. She's what? Well, she said, did me and Eileen want the piano? So I said yes. Oh, heck. What? No, oh, nothing. Just something I've been meaning to do for a long, long time. Sixteen and a half years I've been asking him to do that. And now there's no piano to hide it. There's no excuse. It's not as if I've been short of money lately. Oh, poor Dad. Poor Dad nothing. There'll be no watching cricket on television until this what? room's done. Oh. I know him. Once that's working, he'll sit himself down in front of it. We'll have that bare patch for the rest of our lives. Nobody would notice in the dark. But the cricket. I'll have neighbours dropping in now we've got television. And I'm not having visitors seeing our front room looking like this. He's got ten days to make a nice job before the coronation. Wallpapering would be quicker. Just the one wall, contemporary. It's all being done. Ceilings, skirtings, the lot. Alf! Alf, are you there? Hang on, Alf. Dad? Will Mum be long? Oh, she's in town choosing paint and wallpaper. If it's working before she gets back, she might change her mind. Oh, <laughs> she won't. Ah, I see it's calm down. Aye. Do you mind if I borrow your long ladders? Oh, you're welcome. When, uh, when I get asked in to, to watch, eh? Well, just as soon as... Alf! Alf, you're well off of paintbrushes, aren't you? Being yeah. in the trade. Yeah. What are you doing bank holiday Monday? Uh, or tomorrow, even. Oh, we can't tackle it on a Sunday. You want some painting done Monday? Hi. Start crack of dawn. You, me, our Jimmy, Edward, Lawrence, all of us at it. And then we'll get it finished before the cricket comes on television. Great. Then we can watch till close of play. <laughs> Let's get this off. I know they'll make a mess of it. They seem to be making a good job of fixing the aerial. I don't know why they couldn't leave it to Mr. Summers. He's a specialist after all. Has your dad come down off the roof? Yes. Edward's up there now. Oh, and in with exams still to do. I'm not watching. Mum! What? The wallpaper. 
paper. Well, we can change it when we get fed up with it. It's grand up here. Tell him to angle it towards Holm Moss. Where? Where the new transmitter is. But aim for Old Trafford. OK, you go in and put the wireless on, Dad. Find out the latest score. Oh, yes, please. We can't wait till Monday not knowing. Once everything was organised at home, I thought it was safe to come out. Oh, summer. It's a good job this place was open. Oh, the sooner they've finished and the television's plugged in, the sooner you'll be able to get your feet up and enjoy it. Mm. I'm afraid it might do more harm than good. I mean, it's cosy for older folk like me and Arthur to watch on winter nights, but bad for children. Why, Mrs. H? Well, it can't be good for their eyes, can it? Sitting in a dark room, staring at a little box in a corner. Little interview with homework, believe me. But there's a lovely children's hour. We're coming to your ass to watch the puppets, aren't we, Peter? Oh, well, I dare say that'll be all right. Mm. Lawrence's boss and his wife asked us round yesterday evening, and we saw What's My Line. Gil got hard in losing patience with Eamon Andrews. And there's a lovely programme on Shakespeare. Quite educational, Mum, honestly. Oh, I'd love its uses. Newsreels are meant to be good. And Philip Harbour can show you how to cook. I know how to cook. Wait till you see what we're having for the party, Coronation Day. It'll be a lot of work, but worth it. Been half looking forward to that. Yeah, we'll all help. What's bothering me is, I don't want to slow up yet. Listening to the wireless, I can still dash through my jobs. Baking, mending, polishing, ironing, but with television, I'll just sit and the thing's not done. Are you not compelled to sit and watch it for hours on end? I better do, though, till the novelty wears off. Well, let's try this out as I thought. Just right for a coronation party. I like a job, but we'll put me back in too. Uh, yes, we're very grateful for your help. Hurry up, Dad, it's three o'clock, we'll have started from that. Well, it needs tuning. Last I heard, the auction will back in something. Vertical hole? What's that, Dad? Don't leave that alone. Why don't you make it darker? And then the screen. Oh. How much did it pay for it then, Arthur? Fifty-six pounds. Are you sure it ain't a dad? Yeah, that's a bit chilly, isn't it? But you can hardly wait. Have you finished? Oh, yeah. I thought you'd be watching the cricket. No, no, I'm not, am I? Doesn't it work? No, oh, it worked a treat. Just as we got tuned in, there was a cloud burst at Old Trafford. Pitch flooded. No more play till tomorrow. Oh, Arthur. Have the rest gone home? No. <laughs> They've been sat in there watching the interlude pitch at this past half hour. At least with a wireless, you can tune into another programme when something gets <laughs> brained up. <laughs> She's having his arm. It's the excitement. Yeah. Oh, 
Nice to see you. Oh, oh. you're all here safe and sound. Gee, it looks great. Oh, hi, Mum, we made it. Oh, oh. Trisha, love, what a party we're going to have. Hey, Anton's brought champagne. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, me, I'm dying for a taste of black pudding. We don't leave that in the States. <laughs> oh, well, never mind, love. You've grown into a fine big boy without. Oh, and Elizabeth. Oh, you two, you must be so proud. Come on, let's She's get even lovely than her photos, <laughs> aren't you, my darling? <laughs> Here you are. You'll need extra for tomorrow. Quite a big party, all them visitors. Yes. It's wonderful seeing Trisha's family. Uh, we, we was wondering, Alf and me, uh, whether we might pop in and, and watch your television. Uh, just a few minutes. Of course. You come round, as we? Uh, we're not sure if we was included or not. Oh, you're very welcome. But can you bring a couple of chairs? Oh, yes, we'll do that, all right. What time is it starting? Quarter past ten until tea time. Now, now what if I was to bring some sausage rolls and some hard-boiled eggs? Oh, lovely. Thanks, Esme. <laughs> oh, after all, that makes 15 of us. And half Burke, it counts as two. Well, no one will mind sitting on the floor or on laps. Mr Taylor could watch it at the pub with his bowling cronies, but our oh, family party's nicer. Oh, we'll manage. Grim. Yes? Why don't you keep your food in the icebox? Icebox? Oh, because, love, your granddad and I talked it over. We decided to buy a television instead. You soon have all the things you rich Americans have got. Just you wait and see. Bradley Forth. Jimmy. Yes, they're here. Bring Peter around to play with Gary. Oh, listen, I need the piano stool back. To sit on. <laughs> Well, we've never had a party like this before. I wonder if the old country's making as much fuss as we are. <laughs> All right, love. I'll see you later then. Bye. It is June 1953, and the eyes of the nation and the world are on London as they await the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Banners and bunting blossom in the streets, and flags are flying in a celebration that signals the beginning of a new Elizabethan age. From stern-fronted public buildings to cosy private houses, the message is the same. Welcome to our new queen. And our own pearly kings and queens, the traditional royalty of London's East End, join with the crowned heads and dignitaries from the four corners of the earth in making the day a celebration to remember. For the first time, our sovereign will be crowned in the sight of millions through the modern wonder of television. A great achievement. And news has just arrived that man has stood on the roof of the world, far away from the coronation preparations. Two men set out to conquer Mount Everest, the world's highest peak. And this morning, we hear that Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tensing have reached the summit. What finer symbol of our nation's greatness than to have the Union flag flying proudly from the highest point in the world. Oh, Hello, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's hoping everybody feels on top of the world this morning. Uh, I'll give him five seconds at the most. Oh, come on, even the Burkitts. Uh -oh. Hey, what's the idea? <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> Did it hit you? Not quite. Well, if men can climb Everest, nothing's impossible. Don't spill any, Arthur. Hey, come on round and have a taste of this stuff, Alf. The fun's just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> for Her Majesty's appearance on the balcony and for the Royal Air Force salute. That, briefly, is the television plan for the first part of Coronation Day. It's surely the greatest moment in television history as we take you now into the heart of London to witness these memorable events. Oh, well. We've just been joined by our overseas yeah. groups. It's better than being there. Yeah. See, keep you close. Yeah. Take you to Aye, and we're not getting wet what's more. Look, there you are. There are four processions. First it's the colonial rulers, then the procession of prime ministers. Oh, yes. And they're members of the royal family. And then we see the Queen Mother yeah, arriving at Westminster Abbey, don't yeah. we? That's another thing with television. We can be everywhere at once. Times like these, I wish we had a royal family back home in the States. Never mind, love. You're quite welcome to share ours. Oh, look, here she comes. And here comes the sovereign's escort of the household cavalry. And behind, riding in the gold coach of state, her husband at her side, 
comes Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Well, the Queen of this realm and her other realms of the Crown, Lavrov. Head of the Commonwealth. The service goes on right through dinner time. While the food's all laid out in the living room, so if anyone feels hungry, you just have to go through and help yourselves. But, uh, Mrs. H, I just think I'm going to do it. Get over the house. Gary wants a balloon and Elizabeth wants a flag. <laughs> You'll know all about it when you and Errol have kids. Here, that's for luck. Mm, it's time you were adding to the younger generation, our Avril. Oh, you think so, do you? Yes, come on. Yeah, hey, do you remember when we were little? She used to argue whether that was a sunrise or a sunset. Well, for our children, it's a sunrise. Maybe. The world won't be such a bad place for new Elizabethans to grow up in, I don't suppose. Bye, Mum. Bye, love. Come on, Eddie. Come on, Peter. Yeah. See you later, Peter. Yeah. Bye. Come along. Bye. See you soon. I'll arrest you too. Bye. 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 Have fun. Be careful on the swings and roundabouts. Will do.
This is the first of two films about the electricity industry, about the generation and transmission of electricity. We shall explore modern power stations and find out how they work. But first of all, some laboratory experiments showing the basic principles. Electricity can be generated by taking advantage of electromagnetic induction. Move a magnet in and out of a coil of conducting material and a current will flow in the coil. There's the magnet and there's the coil. The coil is connected to a sensitive galvanometer. Watch what happens. A current flows in the coil only when the magnet's moving. When it's still, no current passes. Here's another magnet, a permanent magnet, like the one we've just used, but a different shape. We're going to make up a simple electrical generator using this magnet and this single turn of copper wire. It's fixed on an insulating handle and connected to the galvanometer. If we just move it around between the poles of the magnet, again a current passes through the copper wire just as long as it's moving. If we rotate it like this, we get an alternating current, which changes its direction, first flowing one way, then the other, as the coils rotated. But of course the wires get all tangled up. This is what's happening. When the loop's moving through this position, the current flows down the right-hand side in this direction. But the loop continues to rotate, and when that side has come across to here, and is moving upwards through the magnetic field, the current induced now flows in this opposite direction. So, as the loop rotates, current passes first in one direction, then the other, and alternating current is produced. The current along the yellow lead is first travelling one way, then the other, as the loop turns. While that along the black lead is always flowing in the opposite direction, first one way, then the other. Here it is again. Using just a single turn of wire, we get only a very small current, and as we saw before, the wires got all caught up in a very short time. So we can use this device. The same single loop of copper wire, but one end's connected to this copper ring on an insulating spindle. While the other's connected to the second copper ring, the insulated connecting wire passes underneath the first ring, then it's joined to the second one. These are called slip rings. We mount this device so that it can be turned by a crank. Each of the two rings brushes against a metal strip so that there's electrical connection between the loop as it rotates and two terminals down at the bottom. Each end of the loop is always connected to the same terminal. We've now made an improved alternating current AC generator, although the EMF it produces is still very, very small. The galvanometer needle shows us that it is AC, alternating current, changing its direction regularly as the coils rotated in the magnetic field. Remember, there's got to be constant movement to keep the current flowing. Instead of using this sensitive galvanometer, we can show that we are generating alternating current by using a cathode ray oscilloscope set so that it draws for us the current produced. 
a sort of wave moving up and down as the current changes direction. You can see how the current goes first positive, then negative, and then positive again, and so on. Here's a different arrangement. Instead of the slip rings, the two ends of the same copper wire loop are now connected to one of two split rings, which are separated by an insulating strip. This is called a commutator. In this position, you can see how the right-hand side of the loop is connected to this terminal, while the left-hand side is connected to this one. When it rotates, the right-hand terminal is always connected to the side of the loop which is moving upwards, while the left-hand terminal is always connected to the side moving downwards. So current taken off from the two terminals will always be flowing in the same direction. And the galvanometer shows that this is so. We've now got a direct current, a DC generator. The cathode ray oscilloscope draws the pattern as before, and you can see that this time the trace never falls below the line. This is direct current. There it is. The trace never dips below the line never becomes negative, that is, never flows in the other direction. This is a more useful generator, although it's quite a small one. The magnet's now an electromagnet, and the coil's much more complicated, but the principle's just the same. We're turning mechanical energy, turning the crank, into electrical energy. Watch what happens when we start using electricity to light the lamp. the handle's harder to turn. Switch off and it's easy again. When the lamp's on, we have to supply more mechanical energy because more electrical energy is required to produce light and heat energy in the lamp. To produce electrical energy, you have to provide mechanical energy. It's all a matter of turning one kind of energy into another. You never get anything for nothing. We're now going to look at electricity generation on a much bigger scale, but the same applies. We've got to provide other kinds of energy to convert into electrical energy. The source of energy at many power stations is coal, and we'll start at a very big coal-fired station in the northwest of England. This train's bringing 1,000 tonnes of coal and it won't last long, as we'll see. It's unloaded, then taken by mechanical conveyors to the coal stacks. Burning this coal will provide energy, which, in the power station, will be converted into electrical energy. From the coal stacks, the coal is carried up to the boiler house. It's first fed to great mechanical grinding mills, down at ground level, which turn it into a very fine powder. This is just one of the grinding mills which work 24 hours a day, pulverizing the coal. The powdered coal is next burned. Chemical energy is released as heat energy in the boiler furnaces. Here's a simplified diagram. The furnace is like a giant hollow box with pipes running up inside it. 
The heat from the burning coal boils water in the pipes, the boiler tubes, turning it into steam, which passes out through the pipes at the top. This steam, superheated to a very high temperature, passes along pipes to turbines. Here, mechanical energy is produced, as the steam makes the turbine blades rotate. This mechanical energy of rotation is turned into electrical energy by the generators. A big electromagnet, the rotor, rotates inside a system of coils, the stator, and produces alternating current, which can be sent out over the national grid system. The steam which has passed through the turbines is turned back into liquid water in big condensers underneath. The steam is cooled by cold water passing through pipes. The condensate, the water, passes out at the left there, back to the boilers to be turned into steam again. We don't turn out anything like all the energy as electrical energy. A lot is unavoidably wasted as latent heat in the conversion back to water, but it's made as efficient as possible. Air is needed to burn the coal. It's drawn in from outside, and here's one of the huge ducts down which it comes. Each of the four boilers has two furnaces, supplied with air in this way. There's one of the big electric fans which draw in the air. The coal dust is blown along these orange-coloured pipes to be injected into the furnace. Every ten minutes or so, a tonne of coal is burnt at each burner. There are nearly 200 coal burners in the station as a whole. Here are just two of them. You can sense the great heat produced inside the furnace as the coal burns. Well below, at ground level, ash is falling from the burning coal above. You can see some of the boiler tubes, in which water is turned into high temperature steam. Right at the bottom of the furnace, the biggest lumps of hot ash collect. Coal is burned up at a tremendous rate. In just two minutes, the 32 tons of coal in a railway wagon are used up. This giant shovel picks up 15 tons of coal, less than a minute's worth. Every hour, for 24 hours a day, a train load full, 1,000 tons of coal can be burned to make 2 million kilowatts of electricity at this one power station. An enormous amount of energy is consumed. The boilers and furnaces are enormous. Here we're looking down to the bottom. The boiler towers for 200 feet. And the superheated steam emerges in pipes from the top. All operations are controlled from here, the power station control room. Here are the instruments for just one of the four turbo generators. Steam is coming from the boiler at about 560 degrees C. It's led down these pipes to the turbine hall, where the electricity is actually generated. This is one of the four sets of generating equipment. This is where the steam enters the turbines and the mechanical energy is produced to drive the generator. The steam's at over 400 degrees C as it enters the first high-pressure turbine. 
there's a chain of turbines to each generator. The noise is almost deafening as the turbines race round, driving the big generator. The generator housings are painted orange, and you can see them quite clearly. There are three other turbo generators in this great hall. Each generator at this station produces one quarter of the total output. In the control room again, there's a great array of instruments and controls for each of the four generators. Each is sending out over 450 megawatts of electrical power. The station as a whole generates 2,000 megawatts, 2,000 million watts of electrical power. The power is carried from the generators to transformers and switchgear outside, then passes out to the national grid. A large number of power stations, getting their energy from coal or oil or running water or from nuclear reactors, feed electricity into the grid which provides electrical power throughout the land. In the next film, we look at the way in which electricity is transmitted. And we'll look, amongst other things, at another way in which heat can be raised to produce steam to drive turbo generators. This station turned the chemical energy of coal into electrical energy. We shall visit a generating plant where the energy doesn't come from burning a fossil fuel like coal or oil or from running water. Here at a power station in North Wales, heat produced by changes happening in the very heart of the atom, the atomic nucleus, is harnessed to produce electricity. We'll visit this nuclear power plant and find out some of the differences and similarities between a generating station using the old fuel and one using the new.
you explore pond life in spring and summer, there's now available a two-disc computer software pack for use on BBC Model B and Master Series computers, the price £17.95. It also contains pupils' activity materials, which can be obtained separately for £3.75. The pack can be ordered from Mercury Music Limited, P.O. Box 194, Seven Oaks, Kent, TN15, 8TZ. There are lots of buttercups around the ponds in summer, and amongst them I often find little animals like this, a tiny baby frog. I'll show you. Four T. Four T. Each finger is called T. So this is four T. Seven T. Seven T. See? Seven T. Three T. Thirty. Two T. Twenty. One T. One T. 
One T. Ten. Have you got it? One T. Two T. Three T. Four T. Five T. Six T. Seven T. Eight T. Nine T. Ten T. Nine T. Eight T. Seven T. Six T. Five T. Four T. Three T. Two T. One T. <coughs> Not T. The complement in ten T of six T is forty. And the complement in ten T of five T is five T. Easy. My grandfather's clock was to talk now. The grandfather's clock was a door for the shop, so it stood 90 years on the block. It was all about health and the old man himself, so no way, not a penny way. Oh, no, Fred, that's far too fast for a clock song. You're not kidding. Try this. It was born on the morn of the day that he was born. That's all right. It was always his treasure and pride. But it stopped short, never to go again when the old man... That was better. That's a kind of clock, really. Well, when it beats out seconds, yes. But when it beats out anything, there's nothing special about a second. Hmm. Why don't we make a clock? <laughs> don't be silly. I'm not. There must be something in here we can use. <coughs> Mary, you can't make a clock out of this old rubbish. Why not? A clock's only a machine which takes time to do things regularly. Ah. Take this plumb line. Hmm? Each swing takes a certain amount of time. So if we count each swing, we're counting lengths of time. One, two, three, four. Uh but you can't tell the time with that, can you? No. Not unless you connect it to a dial of a clock or something. Mm. Look, I think we could make a clock with this. One, two, three, Yes, each marble takes the same time to go down the slope. Yes, well, the same length of time. Yeah. So, all we need is a supply of marbles up this end. One. Two. With a counting device down here. With a mechanism that will release a marble up here when one arrives... Down, down there. there. Yeah. Oh, is that all? Hmm. Anyway, I still don't see how that's a clock. Uh, a clock tells the time, doesn't it? All the time. Well, you can't just invent a clock like that. Hmm. I don't know.
there. Mm -hmm. The water comes out here. Yeah. And as it does, this float gets lower and lower, which pulls this string here, which turns that rod there, which moves this pointer hand here. Hmm. All right, then. Now make it. I have. Hey, that's great. Mm. How does it work? Well, just take this little stopper out here. Yeah, uh, what's that? It's just coloured water. Mm. And the float's going down. Yes. Ah, uh, look. A dial turns around. Hey, that's fantastic, though. Ah. Wait a minute. What I want to know is what happens when all the water runs out. Ah. Uh. Okay, Fred, it's your turn to choose how the squares touch. Right, and I choose sides, sides touching. Hey, hang on. Let's make the rule that the sides have to touch along the whole length like that, you see. Otherwise, you can make any number of shapes, you see. Hmm. Hmm? All right, so you want whole sides touching. Hmm. And you want to see all the patterns? Patterns are four, yes. Okay. And that's the lot. All possible patterns with four squares, sides touching, ah. I think. 
Well, what about that one? Oh. No, look, it's the same as that one. Hmm. If you turn it over, it's different. Yeah. Hey, what do you think would happen if we had five squares instead of four? That's a thought.
potatoes that have started to grow new shoots. They're called seed potatoes. The farmer's loading them into a potato planting machine at the back of his tractor. He's going to plant the seed potatoes in his field. The tractor pulls the potato planter along. Metal blades scrape trenches in the earth. These people are putting the seed potatoes into a turning wheel. There's a place for each potato. As the wheel turns, the potatoes drop into the trench in the ground. The round discs at the back of the machine cover the potatoes with earth. Planting is finished in the spring, the field looks like this. In the autumn, this is what the potato field looks like. All the steep potatoes have grown into potato plants. They sprouted green leaves above the ground. Under the ground, lots of new potatoes have grown from each seed potato. and the potato harvest begins. The tractor pulls along a machine called a potato harvester. The machine digs the potatoes out of the ground. It also separates the potatoes from the stalks and earth. Then the potatoes are loaded onto a trailer. Soon they'll be sold. Before you can eat potatoes, you must get rid of the soil. You can scrub the potato skins till they're clean. Or you can peel them like this. Crisps are made from very thin slices of potato. This is the slicing machine. The slices of potato are fried in hot fat. Listen to the sound they make. makes the potato slices golden and crisp. The packets of potato crisps you buy in shops are made in a factory. A lorry brings the potatoes to the factory. Potatoes are washed to get rid of some of the soil. Then they go into a potato peeler. 
The sides of the peeler are rough. As the potatoes go round and round, the skins are rubbed off. Look how much cleaner they are now. Some potatoes are not good enough to be made into crisps, so they're checked and the bad ones are thrown away. Next, the potatoes are sliced. slices are washed to get rid of some of the starch. Then they're dried. But they're not crisp yet. This man's making sure the hot fat is ready. There are the potato slices being fried in the hot fat. When they come out of the fryer, they're crisp and golden. Now the salt or the flavor is sprinkled onto them. What taste do you like? A few of the crisps that are too brown are picked out. Now let's watch the crisps being packed to sell in the shops.
Come on. Come on.
Oh, it's back to the land, is it? Well, we all like homemade bread. Should I say back to the Stone Age? What do you think that's for? I thought you wanted it so badly. I do, but not for making bread. Then why do you think I thought you wanted dough hooks? I can't imagine. I'm mixing polyfiller, perhaps. Try the phone again, Chris. And the second time, when I rang, there wasn't any crying, but a sort of a breathing. Or more like somebody holding their breath and gasping. Or trying not to cry. That's it. But there was somebody there. I could feel it. Like in the dark. And you know there's somebody else in the room. Well, the engineer said to call him back if there's any trouble. It's probably the overhead lines. BT! Oh, don't whine. BT! What do you want? I can't work the telly. All I get is hundreds and thousands and crackle. Oh, fix it. Perhaps the move shook it up. 90 miles an hour down the M3 with Dad. There you are. What do you want to watch this for? I don't. It's changed in a minute. Now what? The picture's stuck. Look, that woman, she's still there. Maybe it's a test card. No, she's crying, look. Who's crying? This woman on the screen. She's been there for ages. Now, it must be one of those foreign films. You know, when nobody says anything. It must have got damaged. Turn it off. Yes, turn it off. Oh, it's an awful sound. We must be picking up a signal from somewhere. Like when we stayed in North at that time and got all those European stations. We sometimes pick up Radio Moscow on the hi-fi. This isn't the same, though, is it? I don't know. Look, Annie, we'll have to leave it for now. We'll get Dad to have a look at it. To say it's our fault. Dad won't be able to do anything. Don't tell me. I just wanted her out of the way. Now let's try the hi fi. Now what did we bring? Beethoven. Exactly as they like, eight days a week until they're completely out of control. 
Well, if you spent more time at home, they might consider letting you control them. It may have escaped your notice, but the reason I have to be away is to earn enough money to keep you and the rest of this household. I realise that, and we are all very grateful. Well, please, I... I think we might have the lights on. If it's not too much trouble. It only takes one of you. Where's the radio? In the living room. What's he doing in there? Well, why shouldn't it be there? Where are you going? To get the radio. That generator definitely needs attention. The living room lights... Oh, what's happening in here, too? The generator. I'm going to have a word with the agents. Well, plug it in now. You brought it. Put the news on. Can you get rid of that row? No, I can't. Everything does it. The phone, the hi-fi. Let me sit down. It's interference. It's crying. It's someone crying. It's heterodyning. I don't care what it is. Just turn it off. <laughs> turn it off. You made enough fuss about the tape deck. Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> Charles is hysterical. Will you turn it off? viennent de Londres. Ils vont passer une semaine à Paris.
This is a special announcement for teachers. In September, programmes for schools and colleges will be shown on Channel 4 and S4C permanently and not ITV, and teachers are therefore advised to ensure that their television sets are tuned correctly to receive Channel 4 and S4C. baby is taken home from the hospital where it was born. In this film we're going to see what happens when a woman is pregnant and watch that wonderful process, the development and birth of a new human life. First, let's look at a woman's reproductive organs, her ovaries, oviducts and uterus or womb. The uterus is that bulge ducts branch off it at each side to curl around the two ovaries. Let's look inside the uterus and one of the oviducts. Once a month, an egg, an ovum, is released in one or other of the ovaries. At the same time, the lining of the uterus thickens, ready to receive a developing cluster of new cells if the egg gets fertilised. The egg passes into the oviduct, the tube leading to the uterus, and passes down it. If the woman has not had sexual intercourse, or if she has, has used a contraceptive, the egg cannot be fertilised by male sperm. There is then no need for the specially prepared lining to the womb, and this will be cast off, and with the egg will pass out of her body at her monthly period. The male reproductive organs. Spermatozoa, sperm, are produced in the testes. They pass up into the body, collecting various substances to form a liquid called semen in which the sperm swim about. When the man is sexually aroused, there's an increased blood flow into his penis which becomes erect and stiffer. At the climax of sexual intercourse, semen is propelled into the penis and ejaculated. Here you can see the tiny spermatozoa swimming in the semen. Twenty of them, lined up head to tail, would only measure one millimetre. Each of a man's sperms carries the instructions which can give his characteristics to a baby, just as each ovum carries a woman's hereditary code. At the climax of lovemaking, the semen spurts into the top of the vagina, and some of it passes through into the uterus. This means that if there's an egg on its way down from an ovary, sperm can reach it. Some sperm do not penetrate, but one may. The result will be a fertilised egg containing genetic information from both the mother and the father. From this, a baby will develop. The egg divides again and again, producing a clump of living cells. This becomes attached to the thickened wall of the uterus and the baby starts to develop. Sometimes two eggs may be released from the ovary. If each of them is fertilised by a sperm, twins will result. They're called fraternal twins, and while they'll be fairly like each other, there are differences because each came from a different ovum and sperm. They may be two boys, or two girls, or boy and girl, like the twins in this family. Sometimes a single fertilised egg from one ovum and one sperm starts to multiply normally, then splits into two clumps of cells, each of which develops into a baby. We then get identical twins, always both of the same sex and very similar. What determines whether a boy or girl baby is produced? Well, every living cell in our bodies contains many pairs of what are called chromosomes. One pair is called the sex chromosomes. 
In a woman, the two sex chromosomes, called X chromosomes, are both alike. A woman's ova, eggs, are formed by certain of her cells dividing in two, so that each carries one of the X chromosomes. In a man, the pair of sex chromosomes contains an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. When his sperm are formed by the splitting of certain cells, half will contain X chromosomes and half Y chromosomes. So, if the woman's ovum is fertilized by one of the sperms carrying the X chromosome, the resulting fertilized cell will contain a pair of X chromosomes and will develop into a girl. But if a sperm containing a Y chromosome fertilizes the egg, the fertilized cell will contain an X and a Y sex chromosome and will develop into a boy. If you think about it, this means that there should be as many boys born as girls, which is nearly true. There are other factors to consider. Here's a model of the ovaries, oviduct and uterus, carrying a tiny developing baby, a fetus, about one month old. The uterus will stretch to accommodate the baby as it grows, as we'll see. Here we are at eight weeks. The uterus is larger. The fetus has grown a little. During pregnancy, one of the tests carried out in the antenatal clinic is called ultrasound scanning and it enables the medical staff to find out exactly how old the fetus is by measuring it and to make sure it's developing properly. This probe, pressed gently against the specially moistened skin, measures the echo from high frequency sound waves transmitted into the uterus and a computer uses the figures to plot a picture of the fetus in the womb. This is the picture you get of a 10-week-old fetus kicking its limbs inside the uterus. There's its heart beating. A very lively unborn baby, active in its mother's womb. Here we are at about five months. The fetus is much bigger and looks more like a human baby and the uterus has stretched considerably. It's very important that mothers attend antenatal clinics during pregnancy to make sure their babies are growing normally and to take action if there are any possible problems. Blood pressure has to be taken. We all have a blood pressure but if it becomes lower or higher than normal, then there may be certain steps that have to be taken to make sure that mother and baby come to no harm. Blood samples are taken and analysed because this can provide a clue to problems which may need to be dealt with. It's important to keep an eye on the mother's gain in weight and she must eat the right foods when she's pregnant. The unborn baby's heartbeat can be measured and heard using this equipment. Yes. Using the ultrasound scan, we can see quite clearly the healthy heartbeats of a five-month-old baby inside its mother's uterus. Seven months and the fetus is very well developed inside the greatly expanded uterus. It feeds and gets its oxygen through the placenta, an important organ which grows as the baby develops. It's connected to the placenta by the umbilical cord. What does the placenta do? Well, it's a complicated organ, but we can think of it as a sort of filter. The mother's own blood supply runs on the left of the dotted line, and the quite separate blood circulation of the fetus, the unborn baby, on the right. 
Food materials and oxygen carried in the mother's blood can pass through the placenta to the baby's blood. They pass up the umbilical cord to the developing and growing fetus. The waste products produced in the chemical processes going on in the baby's body come back down the cord and pass through the placenta to the mother's bloodstream to be carried to her kidneys and excreted. There are dangerous things which, if they get into the mother's blood, can pass through the placenta and harm the baby. If she smokes during pregnancy, certain substances which get into her blood can reach the fetus and the baby may be born dangerously underweight, needing special care at the hospital. A pregnant woman must look after her health properly. At about nine months, the baby's ready to be born. There's the placenta, and the baby's head is down here. The baby will be delivered through the vagina, which can stretch to let it through. It's actually inside a sac containing fluid. Here, only one part of this sac has been left on. It actually covers the whole baby. When the baby is about to be born, powerful contractions of the muscles of the uterus push it down through the neck of the womb so that its head passes into the stretched vagina. When it's delivered, the baby now breathes air through its mouth and lungs and no longer needs the umbilical cord which connects with the placenta, so the cord's severed. The placenta becomes detached from the uterus and is expelled as the afterbirth. It too passes out through the vagina. Here's a delivered placenta and you can see the bag, the sack of fluid in which the baby lay inside the uterus. This breaks before the baby is delivered. Here's the umbilical cord. It's rubbery and very flexible. Inside, there are two arteries to carry deoxygenated blood and waste products from the baby to the placenta, and a single vein which carries oxygen and food materials to the baby. The cord is designed so that it can't easily kink and so stop the flow of blood between placenta and baby during the months that the baby is developing and growing in its mother's body. Some parents like to have their babies at home, but most are born in hospital where there are skilled staff to make sure all goes well and to deal with any problems which may arise. That's the father, and their baby is soon going to be born. She has been in labour with regular contractions of her uterus for a little time. Here comes the baby's head, and for the first time it can breathe air instead of needing oxygen from its mother's bloodstream. Sometimes the cord is cut at this stage. This doesn't hurt because there are no nerves in it. The mother rests for a moment. It's very hard work for her. Now another set of contractions and their baby will be born. And here we are. While the placenta, the afterbirth, is delivered, a quite easy process, he's weighed. A fine baby boy. He'll need all the love and care his parents can give him so that he can grow into a happy, healthy human being. Bringing into the world a new life is a very great responsibility and a very great joy. Thank you.
brings us to the end of our programmes for schools and colleges for today. They return tomorrow morning at half past nine with Experiment, Tomorrow It's Biology. We're back now to this evening and let's look ahead to our film tonight.